start.
Welcome everybody. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission for Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. If you can join me with a pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have our call to order. Roll call. Chair Clark. Here. Vice Chair McGill. Here. Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Commissioner Longstreet. Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen. Here. Commissioner Perry. Here. Uh, thank you. Uh, for public, oh, do we have any changes to the agenda today? No? Any written communications? I don't see any before us. Uh, public comment, any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for public dis discussion before the commission. The total amount of time for public comments will be 15 minutes. Looks like we have one speaker slip and that's for Leslie Wiscombe from the Planning Commission. Welcome back. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces and nice to be back. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Planning Commission. I just want to introduce you to um, the uh, liaison to the Parks and Recreation Commission from the Planning Commission, uh, new commissioner, um, Gabe Escobedo, um, who's, oh, there he is. Okay, he moved up, good. Um, and I'm sure he'll do a great job for you. He, Gabe is the um, intramural sports coordinator at UCSB, so he's got um, his heart in recreation. And, um, and he's uh, brand new on the commission. He sat through his first meeting, uh, knows a lot. He's a very quick study and knows a lot about what's going on already in our city. So um, please, when you have a chance, um, you know, if you meet them on the street or just want to have a meeting with them, please feel free to do so and uh, get to know them. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you and welcome. Would you like to come up and say anything or? Uh, sure. Okay. Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. Uh -huh. uh, so again, my name is Gabe Escobedo and uh, I'm really excited about being the liaison to the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, I've done recreation at the collegiate level for 10 years now and so um, I'm excited to uh, st keep up with what's going on in the city with Parks and Rec, and so um, I'm hoping to drop by on most meetings, so you should be seeing my face quite often. But it's very nice meeting you all. Yeah, thank you. We're happy to have you and happy to have a liaison. Thank you. Uh, now we've come to our youth council report. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hello everyone. So as most of you know, I am Julia Miner. I'm, all, I'm the vice chair of the Santa Barbara Youth Council and I am here to report on what we've been up to lately. And so to start off this past week, as you all know, we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. And so I'm happy to say that nine out of 10 members, voting members of the Santa Barbara Youth Council helped at the MLK event and also the march. And then we even had four of our junior high reps help us. So that was really exciting. And then in addition to that, one of the really big things that I want to talk about is the NLC. And this is uh, see, the National League of Cities Conference, which happened this November in Texas, and so I was fortunate enough to go there with my colleague, and so we got to go to the conference, we got to meet other youth from across the whole nation, so that was really exciting. And so now we are lucky enough to actually be appointed to the next committee, which is on the CCC, so see if I got my acronym correct, city, Wait, no, Congressional City Conference. That's the acronym. <laughs> Congressional City Con um, 
conference, which is in March, this March, and so we're gonna help run the youth portion of that. And so because of that, we have had to do quite a bit of fundraising, and we are still in the process of fundraising. We are very lucky that we were able to fundraise $447 at the bake sale in December, and so we're planning to do some more bake sales and some other activities like that. And then also, looking ahead, we are going to do a joint meeting with the Neighborhood Advisory Council, and so that will be in February. And then, yeah, that's kind of mainly it right now, but we will keep you guys updated, and I believe we're also, you guys, I don't know if we told you this, but we just finished our anti-vaping PSA, and so I believe we're gonna be uh, showing that soon, and we're also gonna have a speak out with that, and so, yeah, we'll keep you guys informed. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Longstreet. I'm Julia. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. With your fundraising event, um, I think if you sent any type of information to Rose, she could forward it to the commission and that might be helpful as far as any outreach to us for, for fundraising. And where is the conference going to be held? So it's gonna be in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. I don't know the exact location of Washington, D.C. though, but I can um, get that information. Great. And Good then, luck. yes, we will definitely, I can get you the information for the fundraising. Thank you a lot. Okay. And would you mind saying um, out loud, so if people are watching, they'll know where to look for that anti-vaping PSA once it's finished? Um, so we are gonna have a speak out mm -hmm. about that, and I'm not exactly sure the logistics of where we're gonna publish it yet. Mm -hmm. We have some ideas, but once we figure out exactly where we're gonna put it, I know it's gonna be, some of it's gonna be on social media, mm -hmm. but we're gonna have it uh, somewhere accessible, and so with that, we can also, next time we will have more information about great, that. Great, and we also send the information to Rose yes. so we can see it that way. Yes, Thank definitely. You. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to see young people involved <laughs> in our community at such a young age. Thanks. Yeah. We appreciate your work. Right. And Chair Clark and Commissioners, that um, video will be shown to the Commission at, at a future meeting. Yes, I think we're tentatively talking about February. And once it's shown on TV, it's always on the city's website. So it'll be another way for people to go to the commission meeting to see that video in addition to any other outreach that the Youth Council does. All right, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports. I'll start with Commissioner Perry. Was unable to attend Arts and Crafts this month. Uh, the Park Foundation did not meet in January. Hi. The Creeks Committee also did not meet last month, or this month, or last week. Um, I attended the uh, Neighborhood Advisory Council where Julia gave a presentation, and we also um, discussed the priorities for 2020 and what their meeting schedule will look like. And the other news is that um, Mike Wiltshire, the uh, energy and conservation uh, anyhow his new job is he is the water, new waterfront director so he's leaving the NAC and um, I think in the interim Matt Four will be handling the coordination of NAC um, and also there was a sea level rise presentation last week at City Council and if you didn't um, catch it I would encourage you to go back and watch that online um, It'll be coming to us in February. So uh, I really encourage everybody to kind of get up to speed on it and be able to ask the, all the questions you would like to. So it's a really important topic. Thank you. Um, I was unfortunately unable to attend the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting, but I did visit the trees on the agenda that we'll get to later. Um, commission and staff communications, I think. Uh, ceremonial, ceremonial items, employee recognition. Chair Clark and commissioners, we had two staff recognized for 15 years of service to the city, um, both in our parks division. Juan Omedo is a senior grounds maintenance worker too, and I'm going to garble um, Gabe's last middle and last name. I could probably get the middle name, and Rose will bail me out, because um, I just call him Gabe, it's easier. Um, Karatechea, close, Ville, 
is a grounds maintenance worker to Parks and Recreation, both of them um, honored for 15 years of service. Well, thanks to both of them for their diligent work and their dedication to our department. Um, so a summary of council actions. Did anybody have any questions on those? Uh, Commissioner Longstreet? Uh, I just have a, a comment and we, um, I see all of the caretaker rental agreements that were signed and I did get a couple of questions about this from people and um, it's so important as we deal in this time of, of park safety. I think no one can um, really discount what having someone live there does and how important it is and how important it is to the neighbors um, of those parks. Some of them are somewhat remote parks and uh, I just, I really appreciate that we have this program. So thank you very much. Yeah, I would imagine there's a huge cost savings uh, as opposed to sending park rangers out every night to all of the parks. I think it's just very yeah. helpful. I mm -hmm. think it, um, there's some ownership from our um, employees that live there and there's a certain comfort to park users and neighbors that um, there's eyes on the park mm -hmm. at night. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, my only, I only had one question was on um, item number four with the uh, $94,000 to provide continued architectural services for the Cabrillo Pavilion and Bathhouse. Is that um, in the case of during the course of a construction, if the design has to be changed or there's an unforeseen um, problem with the plan? Is that? Chair Clark and commissioners, uh, we first entered into a contractual agreement with KBZ for short in 2014 and as part of that contract they did both of the both the preliminary design the final design and construction management for the project um, as you know the project has been delayed in completion and has required uh, extra services uh, on behalf of KBC to help us see that project through. So the funds that were approved by city council cover their advice and oversight and assistance to city staff and the contractor in completing that project. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? No, okay. Um, we all have a copy of the minutes and I'm assuming we all read them. Would anyone like to make a uh, motion? Motion to approve. Okay, um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And so moved. That brings us to our street tree advisory committee items. Oh, welcome, Mr. Slack. <clears throat> Chair Clark and commissioners, the first street tree advisory item for review is a street tree located at 1317 Punta Gorda Street. Um, it's commonly referred to as a carrot wood. The parcel <clears throat> behind the street trees being developed into a multi-unit um, complex and they're <clears throat> realigning the driveway and the new, new newly proposed driveway is going to be directly within the footprint of where the existing street tree is located. Um, the committee reviewed the application, um, reviewed the tree on site, felt that the development of the public right-of-way was practical given the development of the property um, and made a motion to approve the removal of the existing street tree with the condition that a newly designated street tree, which is the Coast Live Oak, be planted um, in lieu of the approved removal of the carrot wood. Thank you. I, I, I had a, one question about this. Well, I had a couple questions. One, I, I went onto the site today and I saw some big chunks. Are those things that the stack members had dug away. I've seen them looking for a fungus before. There were some leftover chunks there. Did, uh, were they about this big? When Chair Clark and commissioners, um, that is correct. When, okay. when we were on site, there was some fungal fruiting bodies present. Um, the tree's condition overall when we were on site was would be considered fair, so it wasn't of significant concern, but we did a little exploring um, okay. on site, yeah. Okay, I, th I thought so. Um, and then my other question about this was in the applicant's letter, he said the reason for our request is that we have just submitted for final approval on the architectural board of review, et cetera. Um, is this one of those situations that Mr. Cunningham frequently um, is 
unhappy with that the, the tree has not come before the Parks Commission before it's gone on to either the ABR or Planning Commission? Should it have come to us first? Chair Clark and Commissioners, I believe in this instance the, the process has been followed properly. Um, so we've, we've had the opportunity to review the request um, prior to full consideration from the Architectural Board of Review. Like I'm not mistaken. Well, if they, in November, if they already submitted to the ABR, it seems like it, it should have come to us before. Chair Clark and Commissioners, that's correct. I'm not familiar with this particular case, uh, but because they have submitted for final approval, in order to get their final approval, they would need your approval for the tree removal. Uh, and uh, and it, it seems that, although we can verify, that it should have come after they went for a preliminary design conceptual re review at ABR before they... Um, well, um, to me, it seems as if this is a moot point because the trees in decay and there's fungal bodies, but I do want to... Um, I have, I've consistently heard members of the stack committee express an interest in really having a def definite... Um, you know, chain, which it goes here first and then it goes to the Planning Commission or us and then Planning Commission, I think, and I know, Mr. Slack, that you've tried to talk to the Planning Commission and make sure all the people there know the process, but it feels like there's still issues with the process and I don't know what can be done about it. So, Chair Clark and Commissioners, I, I appreciate your concern and consideration. I, I would add that um, as staff, as Mr. Slack indicated, um, it sounds like we were consulted mm -hmm. um, at, from an administrative standpoint and perhaps didn't find that it was going to create that much of an issue. Um, but there's a, a bit, sometimes it's a bit of a cart and a horse. So mm -hmm. if you come to this commit commission before going to ABR, you go to ABR, you get kind of general sign off and then come to this commission. But depending on where they are between their initial ABR review and their final review, perhaps seeing the project a little bit earlier. I mm -hmm. don't know if we know when they're actually going to submit for ABR review. So okay. we, we understand your concern and it has happened in the past where it's sort of like, well, how does this fit in? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not as clean cut as, right. as it could be. I just, I, I, I worry about property owners wasting time and energy in the event that they didn't go through the process, and then stack and this commission decided against removals. It, if we can continue to educate and communicate. And just real quickly, Chair Clark and Commissioners, if I could make a comment, it, mm -hmm. it is a priority of ours to continue to work with the planning staff and shore up this process. Great. And we'll provide updates along the way as we proceed with them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions for? Mm -hmm. I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. I live right around the corner. This project has been like noticed for quite a long time, like more than six months at least. So I don't know where, <laughs> I'm, I know the process is very long um, from just having done one of my own. It took a year to get the permit. And so um, I guess I'll just say that, you know, I think, the, I think the project makes sense. I think it does make sense to remove the tree. Um, I'm in concurrence with the stack committee recommendation um, regarding the process. It's, it's been in the works for a long time. I'll just say that, I know that. Whether they came soon enough or not, they're coming now. And if nobody else has any more comments, I'd make a motion to approve the yeah, recommendation on the condition that the applicant replace with the 24 box tree, designated street tree. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry, so moved. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory item for review is located at 1171 Crestline Drive. The tree under review is a weeping fig located within the front setback of the property. The applicant's requesting removal of the tree within the front setback due to continued decline. Um, the tree has a fungal pathogen commonly referred to as Oxyparis, which slowly damages and kills the vascular system. The the part of the tree that conducts the water and nutrients up and down uh, along the stem and the branches. Um, the committee reviewed the application. We 
reviewed the tree on site um, and they made a motion to support the removal with the condition that a, um, a new tree be planted within the front setback that can achieve a mature height of 25 feet. Uh, please, Mr. Um, Mingo. Just one question on this. I noticed in the letter that they're requesting not to have a conditional approval because they said that the fungus could would kill another tree if it was planted there. Can you comment on that, please? Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, during discussions with the applicant, um, both during the meeting and on site, uh, they were really receptive to planting a new tree. Um, they were a little confused with the process and were concerned about having to put the tree back in the exact same location. Um, and during discussion with the applicant, we informed them that the, there's a lot of latitude in where the replacement tree can be placed, and they were very receptive to planting a new tree to offset the loss of the existing tree. Are there any more questions? So I'm ready to make a motion that we um, approve the committee recommendation that the removal of the ficus benjamina be approved on the condition that a um, replacement tree that can achieve a mature height of 25 feet be planted within the front setback and to do, 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 do um, good forest management. <laughs> <laughs> the only discussion I have is it took me 45 minutes to find this tree because instead of putting 1171, I put in 1711 and I drove in circles on Crestline for 45 minutes. <laughs> I live on Crestline. You should have just, you should have just asked me. <laughs> <clears throat> Other than that. <laughs> but Google Maps was showing the wrong address, like a little dot off in the woods somewhere. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next street tree advisory item for review is a street tree species designation change for the 700 block of East Yana Nali. Um, initially, when we reviewed this, the designation got split into two parts. It's actually the 700 block and the 900 to 1,000 block, and they were packaged together initially thinking that there might be a chance that one designation would apply for these three or two sections of East John and Ali. Um, we ended up with separate designations, so we, there's a two separate, there's like a packaged motion for the, the two items. And just a little history in terms of this specific designation change, East John and Ali, these blocks are, are designated for Southern Magnolia use. Um, and we've, we've kind of been touching on the uh, emergence of the tulip tree scale, which is a new pest in the area. And it's going to prove to be very problematic um, for, for quite some time. And in an attempt to kind of stay in front of this, we've been um, evaluating streets where that species is designated to, to determine alternative designations so that we have a, the ability to move away from it um, and keep replanting without having to you know, scramble to make designations um, in anticipation of projects and replanting efforts and that sort of thing. So that's why we're, we're reviewing these specific areas. Um, the committee reviewed the existing species profile. Um, there were several um, flame trees uh, existing on the street and they made a motion um, for the 700 block to co-designate flame tree and Queensland lace bark. And then I'm just gonna jump ahead to the 900 to 1000 block because they did a combined motion for both. Um, again, this was designated for uh, Southern Magnolia. And after reviewing the species composition, which was predominantly Victorian box, which is another species of tree that's kind of fallen out of favor um, over the last few years for um, a couple reasons, but a disease is kind of bothering them. And, and uh, it's a pretty short-lived tree in terms of tree life. Um, so they made a, a designation to, or a co-designation to designate African tulip tree, island oak, and forest elder for use in the 900 to 1,000 blocks of East John and Ollie. And the, the motion was unanimous. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry to have missed those discussions. I'm sure that they were enthusiastic. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, just a comment. Um, I think it's nice. It's lovely when you can plant a block all the same. I, I understand that, but I do like when there's variety too. And um, this, these look like they would be have some lovely color in addition to the um, to the street. Um, I would move that we concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee's recommendations for the 700 block and the 900 and 1,000 block of East Yonanali Street. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Slack, for, for preemptively thinking in advance about what the tulip scale will do and having a plan ahead of time before the trees are devastated. I think that shows a lot of foresight on the part of the department, so thank you. Oh. Uh, we have come to the director's report. Chair Clark and commissioners, happy 2020. Here we are in January. January is an extremely busy month for parks and recreation, um, in part, uh, because we do the annual rose garden pruning, and that happened on January 11th this year. We had a great turnout. We had 60 volunteers. We always have a good turnout of staff as well because it takes a lot of vehicles and uh, staff power to take the clippings off-site um, as, as the bushes are pruned. And it's also an opportunity for us to celebrate both the park and, and the rose garden and the fact that we house 1,600 bushes on site and over 200 varieties. We also have volunteers that have been committed for more than 40 years and it's kind of the biggest volunteer day of the year as you can imagine. Uh, Dan Bufano has assisted us in providing trainings for many years as well. We had a lot of new people that came out this year which was, which was fun to see. Hopefully they'll be back next year and it was a beautiful day. So if you go by the Rose Garden now, it looks very different than it did a couple of weeks ago. I should say a couple of months ago. And then also, although not in January, but at the end of the year, we closed escrow on the acquisition of just over five acres of Creekside property at the end of Palermo Drive, which is in the Hidden Valley neighborhood. Uh, it's a addition to our efforts to restore the Arroyoboro watershed where we can enhance, enhance the creek and really take the measure B, the purpose of measure B, to where we, it can go and sustain the community for many decades. So the acquisition um, was also supported with grants. And so we had $800,000 go towards the purchase of the property uh, from state agencies. They're also often in support of acquiring property for the purpose of habitat restoration, wildlife corridors, and water quality. So we're really excited about that project. The Creeks Division is leading it up and they will be hosting some outreach in the near future as we start scoping what we can do with the Creek in that location. And then I um, want to uh, formally announce that the California Coastal Conservancy awarded the department a grant for two new beach wheelchairs which will be housed at our brand new, soon to be opened Cabrillo Pavilion. Uh, we've had beach wheelchairs there for a very long time. I wrote a grant proposal um, to acquire two new ones, one automatic, one push. So those will be purchased in the near future. They'll be housed at the pavilion. We advertise their availability. It's free to reserve and free to use, and um, they're well, well used. They've been well used, so we're excited about that. And then also, they'll also uh, work well with the new boardwalk that we're placing along the beach. In fact, if you walk East Beach, you will see the boardwalk um, and begin to see how the building's shaping up. And hopefully next month, we'll have some more definitive news on our grand opening date for you. So. And then by the time the summer season rolls around and people want to be in, on the beach, uh, we'll have our wheelchairs in place as well. And that's it, unless you have any questions. No, oh, thank you. All very exciting. Um, I did want to say, I noticed that, that Council Member Snedden was out pruning roses with everybody. I saw she posted on Facebook and I wanted to thank her for 
joining the volunteer efforts. That's great, you're correct. Council Member Kristen Sneddon was out there um, mm -hmm. helping prune the roses with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we've got a presentation on the Park and Recreation Facility Sign Program. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Clark, Commissioners. Is this, can you hear me? Okay, good, thank you. I'm gonna present an update on the Park and Recreation Facility Sign Program. Going to overview the intent of the program, the give a history of its development, provide details on the guidelines, and a timeline for the implementation of the project. So signs are really our primary tool that we use, obviously, in our park system to communicate messages, hours, name of the park, um, details such as contact information, rules, and intended uses. So the department realized that it needed to devise a plan for the purpose to update outdated information, such as when ordinance and rule changes occurred, and replace deteriorated signs, such as from graffiti and just weathered, you know, weathered conditions. Also consolidating messages. Um, some of the parks, in particular Shoreline Park as an example, there's a multitude of various signs, and really to make it more concise, uh, and easier for patrons to um, uh, receive their messages. Also standardizing materials and create a consistent look and branding to improve park image and create a plan to replace, update, and remove signs. So kind of this is what it looks like currently, although there have been some updates over the last few years. But as you can see, you know, there is various texts, different colors, there's some graffiti, um, a lot of wording, and so this kind of just occurred over time when we didn't have a plan in place, um, when um, a new sign was installed, other ones weren't necessarily removed. So kind of we ended up with this, this kind of look at the moment. So the background of that is based on that factor. Uh, the program was initiated in 2015. Staff began inventorying all the parks. There are 700 signs that were inventoried detailing their locations and conditions. Also in 2015, a uh, hunt design consultant was uh, hired to develop sign guidelines. And they were out, the purpose of that was to outline sign types design, specifications, and fabrication standards. In September and December of that same year, the commission received reports on um, updates on the, the scope of the program and also the consultant selection. And from 2015 to 2016, the ad hoc sign committee was formed and that consisted of the consultant, staff, as well as HLC and sign committee members and that was to ensure the guidelines were compatible with the city's sign ordinance. And then finally, in July 2016, the final side guidelines were approved at the joint meeting of HLC, Architectural Board of Review, and the Sign Committee. So finally, we had a document that was developed, the sign guidelines document, and it really was to, the purpose of it was to improve the park and facility aesthetics by creating consistent design that was very attractive yet blended in with the environment of the parks. Um, also a cohesive style, a color scheme, there's green and blue uh, tones that are used, fonts that were more readable, and effective messaging for patrons. So limited text and really a high usage of uh, universal symbols, which are both national recreation symbols and then custom designs. Also in the guidelines, there are outlines, outline, uh, outlines standards, such as the creation of a master uh, family of signs, include sign dimensions, letter styles and heights, post heights and material. Um, one of the common posts we're gonna use is a cedar pressure treated uh, four inch squared post, although there are other options available, but that seems that's gonna be the common um, a form of posting. And then the panels themselves are made of uh, phenolic resin, which is a very dense, durable plastic. 
So directly out of the guidelines, this is the master plan sign types. So they're categorized. Um, we have monument signs, which would go at the entrance points, main entrance points. And then these welcome signs. We're actually primarily gonna use the secondary welcome signs and it's just more suitable and they won't go in all parks. It's gonna be where there's of uh, historical significance. And then primary activity ID signs. These are for like playgrounds, um, volleyball, rules, tennis, that kind of thing. So we're gonna be using those. And then the building ID signs. Informational signs um, with a kiosk, which actually we're in the process of uh, developing for um, Los Banos pool. And then commonly are information signs for hours and traffic and directional signs. The primary category, we are regulatory, which is our primary, these are more predominant, located where it's very high, highly visible, very similar to a welcome sign, but this one actually has symbols and the welcome sign has a lot of text or more text. And most commonly would be the secondary regulatory sign and these small singulatory signs. And I'll show you an example of those. So again, this would be our most common, commonly used sign, the secondary regulatory. Um, the specifications list the dimensions, the height of the text, and here is the most common uh, post used, which is the cedar post. And also, if you noticed, um, the mounting is concealed, and that way it's just much more professional looking. And then uh, for EPV, uh, kind of some more significant out of this is the posts. So these are aluminum decorative posts that are black or they're also in the, um, we also can use the city's um, Malaga green. So this is for the EPV district. So these are just some examples of um, portions of the guidelines. So since inception, the department has been updating as at an as needed basis. Programming has occurred, um, which involves content layout and graphics that has been done in-house, and that's really to reduce costs. This is an example of a standard secondary informational sign, and this was installed in August of last year. And then with that, here's another example. These are new playground signs. They're slated to be installed in the next uh, couple months. They're gonna be installed at all 23 playgrounds. And this is due to ordinance changes that occurred in September of last year regarding our, our new park hours and also our exclusive designated children ac uh, access areas. And then we have our single, these are those single small signs, as you can see here. These are one of our older signs that has a lot of text kind of a symbol is a little confusing, and our new symbols is very clear, and the text is very, very clean. So it's, um, you know, just a simpler message and consistent with the other signage. This is a secondary regular, regulatory sign that we have installed at Westside Neighborhood Center. We've installed three of these last year. This will be commonly what we're gonna see throughout the park system as we go forward, the most common anyway. This is an, another new design that's gonna be installed here shortly, and it's an interpretive sign um, at Mission Historic Park. So as you can see, this is kind of um, an idea of the new modern look. So after the guidelines were developed, the actual document, in 2016, Hunt Design, along with staff, needed to get a handle on the scope of the project. So um, they started mapping each park. IDing the new sign types and uh, key locations and based on kind of traffic flow and visibility. So for this example, in Alameda Park, on the west side, it's very sparse. It's not necessary to have as, as, many, as much signage, but yet on the east side, we need more because we have you know, rentals, so reservable spaces, and we have a uh, playground, and there's just different amenities on the other side. So all the parks were mapped. Okay. So after the mapping was complete, kind of um, the staff kind of uh, divided it into two phases and that's based on funding availability and just the, the size of the project. So phase one 
identified 24 key locations. And that's due to high usage, visibility, and quality of the signs at those locations. Um, included in phase one are, are the Ledbetter Beach, East Beach, Shoreline Park, the Brio Ball Field, um, Murphy, Dwight Murphy Fields, for example. So there are 220 estimated signs that we need for phase one to be produced. And again, in all those categories that I, um, the sign types that we went over. And fabrication production will take about three months. So uh, we're gonna, we can begin the bidding process this month into next month. Also, we're gonna contract installation based on the, the number of signs and that process will begin in February with installation estimated to be, to begin in April. Funding was allocated this fiscal year, over 121,000 from the capital program and 90,000 from the tobacco um, law enforcement grant, which is, um, which promotes Santa Barbara as a smoke-free city. And then phase two will be the remaining parks and programming, which is the content and the layout and the graphics that will be done in house this year. And then based on funding, we can possibly begin next fiscal year. And with that, if you have any questions. Um, first of all, congratulations. I have been there every step of the way. <laughs> and um, it's, they look beautiful, easy to read, um, uniform, and give information that I think is missing in many of our parks. And, um, I think it's good for our visitors to know, but I also think it's good for the residents of the city to understand some of the history of our parks by, by the signage. So um, thank you very much. My one question is, you have 36 in the next phase? 36, correct. Parks, 36 locations, right? right. I, will they be as intense as, like these 24 locations seem to have a lot of signage. The next 36 have less? They'll have less, yes, that's correct. Okay. Good, because I, I, I think it's just going to make a huge difference in our parks. Thank you. Yeah, we could. Sorry, kudos to Liz Smith for doing all that stuff in house. It seems like that was a really smart idea. Well, I'll just e echo the, the thanks. I, th I think it's important that we, you know, if you put a, a face forward that says we're proud of our open areas and we're proud of our parks. Um, and we're gonna make, you know, we're gonna show it by how we sign them. Then that, I think that will help drive pride in the parks and the and the recreation areas in the community as well. So I think it's an important thing to do to uh, keep the window boxes planted. <laughs> um, um, I guess a question just for clarity: the open areas, things like Arroyo Burrow, that is there a plan? Well, that does have a nice sign as it happens, but is there a plan to expand to them as well? Chair Clark and, and Commissioner McGill, we actually already have some of our new signage there. Right, and are you speaking of the new acquisition? Just in general, the open areas, do you plan to treat them the same as the, the parks? It, you know, each park is looked at individually, and um, we, we began the mapping process in 2016. We've probably revisited it a number of times uh, as we further consider location, number, uh, open space areas do need to have some basic information as it relates to what we want people to do there and what we don't want them to do there and when they can be there and not there. Uh, we generally trend toward more interpretive signage in those areas because we're trying to provide a message pro mostly about the ecology or or something, or the habitat, or things that are going on. So it's more likely to be those signs. And it's, um, our goal is not to sign everything. And I think if you visit the Douglas Family Preserve, for example, the actual management plan only allows signs within a certain distance of the entrances of the park. And part of that is to maintain the natural environment and not gunk it up with infrastructure.
Oh. Yeah, just one Please. last question. And is there any, and I don't even know quite how to ask this, but obviously there's a number of regulations out there that people routinely ignore, um, particularly in some of the open areas with, we say, dogs on leashes and things like that. Has there been any work done that's available that suggests that there is a type of structure, language in signs that is more apt to get people's attention and have them say, okay, this is why, this is why they're asking me to do this than, than not? Is there any, I, I, I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, um, what we learned through the sign guidelines process and working with Hunt is symbols really do the best job. It's up to the individual to decide whether they want to follow the symbol or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, our goal as a department and as a community is for us to all exist harmoniously and sometimes obeying the rules is a good way to ensure that happens. The, the signage also gives us the opportunity to enforce rules if necessary. Um, so it's that balance between reminding people what we want them to do or not want them to do, and then hopefully that just happens and we don't have to do a lot of enforcement. Um, but then, you know, educating people the whys, the why we don't allow dogs off leash in this location. And the Royal Borough Open Space is a primary example. It's a wildlife corridor, and we have lots of other off leash locations very nearby and things like that. So we try to try to explain the why and hopefully um, people understand and, and follow the why. I, I did appreciate that you added the vaping to the no smoking um, signage since that's a, a problem these days. And I, I, had, I had one question, what are you gonna do with the old signs? Because maybe we should donate them to the youth council and let them have a fundraiser because kids like to steal signs and they could have like this <laughs> legal <laughs> sign stealage and raise some money for their conference. I would buy, there's a lot of those signs I would buy. Not steal, buy. <laughs> Chair Clark and commissioners, we actually hadn't gotten that far. I can tell you that many of our signs are really in quite poor condition. Um, and I, I'm not actually sure it would be legal for us to allow someone to take a sign that was a regulatory sign that belonged to the city. Don't know the answer to that. Because um, you never know where it might show up somewhere else. <laughs> Sometimes things arrive in our parks that we didn't put them, put there. Interesting, I like that. Yeah, well, we can just put it on the back burner. Watch American Pickers, they paid big bucks for yeah. the old signs. <laughs> Is there, are there any more questions or discussion? Congratulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now we've come to our advisory committee liaison appointments. I think, I, yeah, yes. just if everybody's happy. Um, I would just, they've changed the Neighborhood Advisory Council to Monday nights, mm. and I think it's a second Monday night. And that doesn't mean I haven't tried to show up on a Wednesday. Um, have you, has, uh, are you aware of whether Corey and Jacob want to continue with their current assignments? Chair Clark, um, Commissioner Lesnar Buxton indicated he would like to continue on the Youth Council, um, and he's enjoying that. And I think Commissioner Baker is on golf, and I believe he's enjoying that. Um, but I did not hear directly from him. I'm gonna say, um, one suggestion, I've just been speaking to my fellow commissioner, um, is to have her join me on NAC, because there is no east side, um, there's very, the, the east side representation has gone down, and I'm on the west side, and it would be lovely to have another liaison from the I other live, side. Yeah, I live on the east side. I, would, I can be a secondary. 
great. Um, and when I can make it, I'll be happy to go. Okay. And I think the um, NAC would appreciate it. Yeah, I've always had a little bit of an interest in going on that one. I do really like the creeks. Oh, you don't have to give them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you give anything up. I'm just <laughs> adding more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Perry, are you okay? Thank you. Commissioner McGill, Vice Chair McGill. Yeah, I'm fine with Park Foundation. Do you need a second on the Street Tree Committee? I don't. Do you? I'm completely content to do it. It's my okay. favorite day of the month. I don't know if they take two, but I don't no, see I'm why not, you can't. No, I don't need to, I don't need to be there. So I'm that, that's a question for Mr. Yeah, Slack. It's, do, I don't think we need two people there. Yeah, no, I would love I, to stay on it. It's just a question of do you, are you, are you stretched enough that you feel like you want an alternate? No, that's my favorite thing of the month. Okay. okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> hmm? But it is. Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, it, it is a public meeting. Mm -hmm. As oh. You are an, uh, certainly welcome to attend the meeting. It, it starts at, at 402 East Ortega, mm -hmm. and then actually they get in a van and drive around. But yeah. you should always feel like if you wanted just to attend, mm -hmm. to I, it watch was what was going on, you're she want a little able. unburdening. It, it brings great joy, literally great joy every month to do the meeting. I absolutely love it. I'm not kidding. I love it. You should come sometime and you'll see why. They, these, do I'm you sorry, take they, her out for coffee no, and donuts? We, <laughs> we don't get to stop for coffee. We don't get to stop use a restroom. But the, the people on the committee are so intelligent and well informed and they've got such they've got such consideration of like property rights and public rights and it's just I just, I am very much in awe of the people on the committee. All of them, they're all great. That's but, so great. You know, we do have so many um, newer commissioners at this point mm -hmm. that I would say it wouldn't be bad to have everybody go once mm -hmm. with you, not to, not discussing liaison, but to yeah. just attend one of them if they can. It would be really nice if everyone came to at least one this year so they could see the, the thought processes and kind of um, see how it happens. I think it would... Um, give you great confidence in staff and in their public trust. It's it's great. You should come. Yes, please. Um, we will assume that uh, Commissioner Baker would like to stay on golf. He can notify us at some future date if he does not. And um, same with uh, uh, Commissioner Buxton. So we're all happy with our current assignments. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Chair Clark and Commissioners, I'm realizing now we neglected to include the Sea Level Rise Adaptation oh, Subcommittee right. and the Delicare Plaza Subcommittee. That work is still ongoing, so we do have appointees to those um, to those groups. And unless the Commission wanted to make a change, um, I think there's there's a number of meetings coming up that um, Commissioners will be attending. Okay. And I do too, and, and sea level rise. And sea level rise is a lot of the heavy work mm -hmm. has been, well, it's starting again, I guess. But it's, um, it's been good to have that continuum. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And it makes sense to switch now. No. Uh, thank you. With that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you.